S-C-H-E-R. It's being recorded at what what library branch is this, Tommy? The Brentwood Library Branch. Brentwood Library Branch in Springfield, Missouri. This is the 16th of May, 2007. Tommy Pottick is interviewing. Jerry Benner is doing engineering. Both are members of Route 66 of Missouri. Today we're interviewing Karen Eicher and her father and mother own the Seven Gables restaurant west of Springfield on 66 and the Cordova Motel uh, in on uh, Route 66, which was on College Street Road. <coughs> and uh, Karen, could you tell us? Uh, what years your parents owned these? Um, about 1948, I believe, was the year that they moved to Springfield from Great Bend, Kansas. Bought the motel first. It was a three-acre piece of property right on the bypass and College Road. And then uh, they owned it until... They owned it until uh, it was sold about 1972, and it was um, torn down at that time. Time. And then (coughs) what was the name of the uh, Dairy Town? Dairy Town was brought in years later uh, and placed on an empty lot that was part of the original three-acre parcel. It used to set out on Glenstone where Anton's restaurant is now, and my dad bought the building, they brought it out one day on a big flatbed truck, and had concrete slab poured, plumbing, electrical, and just set her down, and we were open in about three days. Hmm. And it came from where Anton's is now, there yes. on South Glenstone. Right. <coughs> uh, how long did he operate that business? It was, in, it was open until the entire property was sold in 73. And uh, when did he own Seven Gables? He owned Seven Gables from uh, approximately 1954 until 1960. And then he uh, sold Seven Gables, and it's still operating. It is. It is. Back then, it was a kind of a two-step process. One side of the building was a large gas station. They were able to fill cars and 18-wheelers, and that was was owned and operated by a man named Claude Keith. And then the restaurant portion was my father's. He didn't operate the station facility part of it? No, Claude Keith was responsible for that. And uh, he was, uh, he had this property prior to the interstate, which came through there west of that area. Correct. In 62, I believe. The construction on it was prior to that, but I believe it opened in 62. Uh, and once that, once that was started, that was rerouting all the traffic coming from the west on Route 66, it diverted them away from his businesses, of which the first one you would drive into would be Seven Gables, and that was just you know a few hundred yards from where this new highway came through. And then the Dairy Queen, or Dairy Town, and the motel was not quite one mile east. Uh, there at, uh, well, the bypass and College Street Road, <coughs> which was Highway 66, the bypass stopped there at College Street. It didn't run on to the south for at that time. No, it, not, a, not originally. It just went to the north as though you were headed up toward the airport. Yeah, towards Kearney Street. Right. You know, and that was <coughs> the 66 bypass then. But that was even back then, that was a big major intersection. On the um, northwest corner was a business called the Bypass Terminal, and it was a 
multi-level building that would house overnight truckers and they had showers and uh, gas pumps and all the things you need to buy when you're on the road. The Wishing Well Motel was there then and still is there now and that was on the southwest corner and then we were on the southeast corner of that intersection. And uh, I believe you said that uh, where Dairytown was that they tore it down and they put a Mr. Quick in there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't there too long. The Mr. Quick it was a um, gas station there. Quick serves at one of the first self-service gas stations I had had seen. And then the Mr. Quick came in right next door to that. Didn't wasn't there too long. The uh, Back at that time, most of that area out there was still kind of, there was a lot of rural area around it. it. There wasn't lots of businesses in that area. To the west there was Young's Orchard. Mm -hmm. Young's Orchard, um, across and from that one block area, or one mile area from our business to the west was primarily small motels like ours. The Lone Pine, uh, there were several along in there, and then there were a lot of little taverns and bars scattered along the way. The Tumble Inn, the Downbeat, the Ritz Club. There was a mile stretch of um, little motels, and, and then the rural areas were right off of that main road. Another nice thing that I have memories of is the um, Sunset Drive-In. It was about halfway between where the motel my family's motel was, and the Seven Gables truck stop. On the north side there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I believe there's a Sunset Trailer Park or something. I think it is in Noble Home Park now. Uh, the other day I said there, and I don't believe there's too many mobile homes in there, but that, that's what it's laid out as now. Uh, the uh, That area in there, uh, and then to the east of your folks' motel, well, a few blocks, was Reg John Hamburg mm -hmm. was up there. All right, they were very friendly competitors. <laughs> Had to kind of keep stay buddies so they'd know what the other one was up to. And, uh, yeah, we uh, interviewed Julia uh, a year or so ago uh, on the Oral History mm -hmm. Program. And uh, well, she was very good. She's since passed away, but uh, when you were growing up out there, where did you go to school? I went to Westport. It was just a few blocks oh. east and uh, a couple of blocks south of, of that stretch of highway. Went to Westport and then junior high school at Studi and high school at Central. The bypass was actually the dividing line. If you lived on the east side of the bypass, you went to the Springfield school system. If you lived just a, you know a foot to the west of that street, then it, that was all um, Willard. Oh, we went to Willard schools, and uh, what did <coughs> out there uh, along in that area was it Nichols School that was out there on Sixty Six? Mm -hmm. That that it belonged to Willard school system. You know, technically, I would assume so, because I know that no one went to the Springfield Public School System if they lived west of the bypass. Yes. Uh, Nichols must have been an early part of the elementary system for Willard. I, uh, I know the school building is still there, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and everything. I was curious if it, who it belonged to, really didn't know. Uh, most of your uh, your dad run the Dairy Town and uh, Seven Gables, and I guess uh, that pretty well kept him busy most of the time. Oh yeah, it was. Um, you know, even in the winter time, there was still you know maintenance and things like that to do. the The Dairy Queen, the Dairy Town business we had, really was not seasonal. It was. There were a lot of locals that ate there. He always was an early morning person. 
and he would be in there serving breakfast for just the local people that worked and, and lived in that area. So that part of the business kept him busy once he moved that part in all the time. And then we had the, you know, motel rooms always need upkeep and maintenance. There was three acres to mow, and it was just, it was just like a park. Lots of big trees back then. Those are all gone now. And um, at the, the small family-owned motels back then were kind of a, a haven from the concrete instead of what you see now, big motels and hotels with expanses of concrete parking lots. We had lots of green grass and beautiful shrubs and trees and um, the yard, our yard that was a part of our house was actually shared with the, the motel guests. We had old-fashioned gliders and air on deck chairs and uh, picnic tables and that was our personal yard but it was also used and enjoyed by the guests that spent the night at the motel. They could go out and sit in the mm -hmm. chairs and rest and everything after being on the road all right. day. Do you remember uh, much about the price structure and that for the <laughs> motel and what it cost? Yeah, we had, um, we had some rooms that were doubles, so they were actually two adjoining bedrooms divided by a bathroom. And um, the big doubles were the expensive ones. Those were 12 to $14 a night. The single rooms were anywhere from 5 to $7 a night. And the whole atmosphere was different. Instead of, you know, you check in and then you never see that person again, it was almost like they were coming to stay at our house. They just had a, a bedroom that was out in a different building. Um, they came in and out all night to use the phone or uh, ask for directions or we would sit out in the yard for two, three hours and sit in the gliders under the shade, talk about travel and their destination and what their purpose was in passing through Springfield. Um, they were acquaintances by the time they left their stay at the motel, whether it was just one night or two, three nights. These people you know, people made connections back then, and sometimes they even exchanged addresses, and it became, you know, a long-term acquaintance. What did you do as part of the family running that? Uh, when I was a real small child, I started, uh, my mom and I got up every morning and changed the sheets and all the beds, uh, sorted all the linens for the, the linen service to come by and pick those up in a truck. The linen service was right down the street east of us on College Street, uh, just before you get to Kansas. It was called Springfield Laundry back then. So we changed the sheets, cleaned the bathrooms, got the rooms all ready. Um, Dad was usually outdoors doing the mowing and maintenance, that kind of thing. My mom and I took care of all the rooms and made sure those were clean. Um, then when I was uh, about seven, is when he got this the, uh, Seven Gables truck stop. And the only thing I was allowed to do was peel potatoes. <laughs> Just like being in the Army. Yeah. yeah. We had ladies that had worked there for years, and one specialized in pies, uh, Mrs. Griswold. And um, another lady had, you know, everybody had the responsibilities. He hired a lot of young girls that went to the uh, Willard School System that were lived in that neighborhood of Seven Gables. Then when I was uh, 10, this was about 1961, he bought the Dairytown building and moved it in. And from that point on, I had standard 40-hour a week shifts that I worked from age 10 on. And your wages were? I made, I made uh, <laughs> let me think here. Back then, I remember the girls that worked for him. At first, it was all 50 cents an hour. It wasn't too terribly long that minimum wage had gone up, and you know, it was it was a big deal when it got up to a dollar an hour. So I made seventy-seven dollars, I believe, seventy-seven dollars a month was my. I was on a salary because I was the boss's daughter, and he just he was kind of like the the old-fashioned direct deposit. He drove to the bank, put the money in my account, and I wasn't allowed to touch it, but I knew it was there. And you were 
your salary, so you can do <laughs> 50 hours if you had. Right. right, right. You didn't get overtime. No, no overtime. No overtime pay, lots of overtime hours, but no overtime pay. It was almost too handy when, when we had a, I remember Dad installed a buzzer and buried this electrical or some kind of wiring between, you know, the dairy town and our house. It was, um, I'm not very good at judging feet, but it was, it was, um, I'd say maybe 20 car lengths from the house to the dairy town. So if you did get a chance to go home, Mom used to go home and watch your soap operas in the afternoon. If we got busy, boy, he wanted that button so he could push that button, and that meant get over here now. So there wasn't a whole lot of downtime between keeping motel rooms clean, keeping the, the yard and the property looking nice, and running the Dairy Queen. I mean, it was open till you know, midnight, or you know, his theory was... When the customers quit coming, that's when we close. If it was 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., and a football team came through town on a bu on a bus and they were hungry, you know, we unlocked those doors and started working. There were no regular hours really back then. You just worked till there wasn't any more work to do. Why did he finally close it? Uh, by the time it closed in '73, he was. Um, well, he was born in 1902, so he was 71 at that point. And uh, things had changed. It had been a big struggle, especially when the I-44 came through. I mean, Route 66 was the, you know, the artery to our financial world and our life. And it was just like someone all of a sudden cut that off. And um, he was responsible for starting a West Side Betterment Association group that tried to, you know, I guess he just hadn't figured out yet that you can't fight City Hall, but they sure tried. They wanted that entrance or that exit coming off to go to start further east and north so that this West Side Betterment Association of Businesses would not be so drastically affected. And it got to the point where it was almost like a war zone between the highway department and who all was making all these decisions. They were building Holiday Inn, the one that's out on North Glenstone. And um, there were there were a lot of um, there were a lot of signs put up encouraging the traveler to not take that old 66 road and to stay on the new interstate. And um, you know, once his group got up and going. Many of those signs mysteriously were cut down, and you know, that happened several times. And I remember <coughs> newspaper people would come out and want to interview my dad and ask him, you know, these thought we keep putting up these signs. Someone's putting up signs, and someone's cutting them down. And of course, you know, he didn't know anything about it. But of course not. Um, you know, that article that I brought you from the newspaper was a, a part of that. You know, all the signs going up was was. Uh, it was a huge change. He had to completely revamp his whole you know, business plan. Here we had this little motel with only six units in it. So each and every one was vitally important. When there's no more tourists coming in off of Route 66, he had to do something different. And he always had a good idea for something. You know, this whole idea of a, having a business plan and... and um, keeping on top of your business isn't anything new. People have always had to do that. He took those six units and remodeled them and changed them to little what they called kitchenettes. They had a, a single burner hot plate, a tiny little apartment-sized refrigerator, um, very few small kitchen cabinets, and um, he ended up renting those by the week instead of nightly rentals, and his best customers were the construction workers who were building the highway that was taking his business away. So he kept those by the week, and then once all the highway work was completed after a few years, then he rented them more like little apartments by the month. And, um, and it was a struggle. It was a whole different type of business than, you know, the couple or the family that was just coming in on a vacation and, you know, had some leisure time and evening time to sit and visit. 
you know, these were working people that just basically came in to sleep and to live there because, you know, they, that was convenient or the price was right or whatever the reason was. So it, did, it changed the whole um, atmosphere of, of our work life. But by that time, the focus was off the motel and actually on Dairytown. That was, of all the businesses and ventures that he had, that was his most successful and financially rewarding business was the Dairytown. And then he retired yes. from that and sold the business. Right. And then eventually went away. Right? Made many, many, many friends over the years. I believe it was Pete Rhodes, the, um, I think it was, I think Pete Rhodes was a uh, the owner of Webster Oil Company back then, he actually bought that property and then leased it to the gas station that moved in there first. All gone. All gone. It's hard to recognize very much in that part of town. It's, it's nice to see the Wishing Well Motel still there. There's very little in that area that is still there. Now Young's Orchard turned into housing development mm -hmm. <clears throat> most of the motel or larger pieces of property the property got worth more than the business was on it and mm -hmm. it went away for something else and that's basically the story on route 66 everywhere i mean you know it <clears throat> didn't well they you know now like uh well, I noticed that corner out there now starting to build up, and they've kind of in there behind where your folks' motel had been. They've cut some streets in there, and there's two or three uh, businesses building in there, and <clears throat> there's a couple of fast food restaurants going in there and everything. So, you know, it's changing the complexity, and now they're widening the bypass. It's going from a Two lane, and they took all the train over passes down. Yeah, I, and I drove down Main <coughs> Street for the first time going to the airport uh, a few weeks ago, and it was just an amazing change. I have a photograph. I started to bring it today, and I didn't because that wasn't on Route 66. But I have a photograph at one of taken at one of those overpasses. They used to flood very regularly anytime we had any kind of rain at all, and they could flood as deep as the roof the height of a roof of a big car, and I have a photograph of several cars being caught there as this flash flooding came yeah, through, yeah. and it was amazing to see, but that was a pretty regular occurrence. So now that all those areas aren't so low-lying anymore, and those overpasses are gone, that won't be a problem. That's a pretty important vein to get from south to north Springfield when you're in the west part of town. Yeah. That, uh, uh, They've gone through and put uh, water drainage in that, and mm -hmm. they've fixed it to where the water will run away. And well, they had to. <clears throat> they did that years ago. It, uh, but they've changed the looks of that area because now it's four lane with a center turn lane all the way. It's actually five lanes wide, and the uniqueness of it is gone. Mm -hmm. That's always been the by West Bypass from Kearney, where you would turn to go to the airport. Kearney to College Street, where we were, was always a pretty busy area. That was the main way you would come when you were coming from the airport going to downtown. Yeah. When you turned at our corner, it was just a straight shot, not quite three miles up to the square. Of course, that was the main heart of, of the downtown area back then. Anytime any of the presidents were would fly into Springfield, the motorcade would come um, down Kearney to the bypass, come south to college, and then go east down toward um, City Hall and the square area. I have a lot of great photographs of uh, like 1948 Cadillacs, big black Cadillacs with uh, President Truman and President Eisenhower sitting up on the back. The top would be down on the Cadillac. They would be setting up on that back, you know, behind the back seat, waving, and people were just lined up in the street all the way from 
college and the bypass all the way that whole three mile stretch. That was a big, big deal when Fresno was coming to town. They uh, <coughs> generally they go down and either stay at uh, the Kentwood or the Colonial. spend some time. I know uh, <clears throat> Truman visited here two or three times. And also it was, you know, pretty, uh, pretty big deal. Yeah, I'll have to keep looking for those photographs. That might be something you want to, yeah, we'd like to include have in your archives. Too. There's some great photographs in there. like the Dairy Queen <clears throat> or the Dairy Town and all the businesses uh, have changed and the chain franchises have taken the little places out and the business atmosphere is way different than it used to be. It is and I don't know that all that's, you know, to me it was better the way it was before when you compare a family owned small motel to a you know, a big chain of a hotel and compare the small dairy town to a, a McDonald's, for an example, nothing against McDonald's, but, you know, there's, there's so much lost in just, um, you know, customer service and, you know, our customers, you know, customer service was the big issue at the time. People really paid attention to what the customer wanted, what the customer needed. You know, I remember times families would come to the motel, <clears throat> and back in the 50s, it wasn't uncommon for, you know, the average family to really have to be very penny conscious, when, especially when they were traveling. But there were people trying to move cross country, load the kids and the dog and whatever few possessions they had, and drive clear across the country. And us being in the Midwest on 66, they always passed by many times stopped and um, if they didn't have much money mom would run up on College Street to the consumers there at West Avenue in college buy a whole chicken come home cut it up fry it take it out to them I mean can you imagine going to Holiday Inn <coughs> mentioning to the clerk that you were having a really hard time and fried chicken show up at your door <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen but that was pretty common well, I, I can remember traveling as a kid. It was all the motels were mom and pops. There were Holiday Inn. You couldn't, family couldn't afford to stay in a Holiday Inn. You'd always go down and check out the room first. I mean, I don't think many people go check out the room anymore. They just yeah, that was real common. I, mean, I remember being responsible for if my parents were busy in the other part of the property or maybe gone for a little while, they would leave me there alone, usually even as a pretty small kid. And people always, not almost, not always, but usually would want to see the room. I'm sure there were places that probably left a lot to be desired and they wanted to be sure that it was clean and it was a place they were going to feel safe with their family. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine now going into one of these all day in Express or something like that and check it in and say, I'd like to see the room. They wouldn't even know what you're talking about. I mean, they'd look at you really like, you, like you need to. They're all, the quality control right. is... They're all pretty right. standard. Yeah, and that's kind of what Holiday is. <coughs> McDonald's did set standards. standards. That's why people stopped that. Yeah, and standards are good, but with, you know, it seems like in the old days, some people had incredibly high standards without being forced to do so. That was just the, their their part of their business plan and the way they, they lived their life was to do the best that they could and provide great places for people to stay that were comfy and and um, you know clean and hospitality was, you know, the name of the game back then. That's something you don't see much of. I notice when I go to Branson people are incredibly warm and friendly. And they do make you feel welcome when you go to certain places, you know, in Branson, because the tourist trade is what it's all about there. The old Route 66 businesses, I think, had that same that same theory. <clears throat> Everything was about hospitality. They wanted it was important for people to feel 
like they they knew you were glad that they came, whether you were feeding them or putting them up for the night. It was very important for these people to know that you were very appreciative and very glad they came. You don't see that real often anymore. Well, back then, <coughs> in the mom and pop uh, places, uh, they didn't have a big budget for advertising. And uh, <coughs> what they had to sell was service. And if people stayed there and they were pleased mm -hmm. with the room and the service and everything, uh, they survived on the word of mouth, and right. people would travel, and they'd say, well, if you stay in Springfield, do you need to stay so-and-so, because they have a nice room. Well, that's true. We had a zero advertising budget. Um, I, I have some newspaper articles, with the, specifically the one for the grand opening of the Dairytown. Dad was hiring a band, and they brought in a big flatbed trailer behind a truck, and that was where the bandstand would be. And... Um, it was a big deal, so they spent the money for a newspaper article for that, but that was very, very unusual. Do you have a lot of repeat customers, like <laughs> salesmen and that? Oh, yeah. A lot of people we knew by name, and um, they just stopped, and you recognized their car just like it was, you know, Uncle Harry. You knew that was uh, the, the banker man or the salesman guy, and we had a lot of repeat customers. Even families, so that a lot of people made the, this area a regular visit because even back then there was a lot of good fishing in, in the Branson area. Um, a lot of good trout fishing down on Tanny Como. <coughs> Boat races, um, yeah, that, is, that attracted a lot of people back then, even before the big Branson boom came along. That was a boom. It sure <laughs> was. Yeah. <coughs> and that, uh, well, that, that area down there has changed <clears throat> just beyond belief. Uh, I mean, it's uh, well, like Silver Dollar City. You used to drive at Barron Park in the middle. <clears throat> you could drive down there uh, on Sunday afternoon after church to eat. My gosh, it takes you half a day to get in there now just to and. You know, you just drive up there and park and go in the restaurant there and eat and fiddle around and come home. Didn't cost you anything. <laughs> You've almost got to set a whole day aside now to go to Branson. <laughs> I remember being up in, I think it was Regina, Saskatchewan, in Canada, walking in the car. Came to the car because the car had Missouri plates. And this couple came up and said, you're from Missouri. Where are you from? We said, St. Louis. Is that anywhere near Branson? It's because in the way they come down here for the Christmas thing in winter. All the way from the middle of rural Canada. Unbelievable. <coughs> but they associated Branson with before they did. Yeah, but before they did. It was. I guess if you drove down and flew to Kansas City or something. And, uh, Sometimes, like the Branson area or other areas, not just Branson, the uniqueness that made it what it was, they've tore it down. Mm -hmm. It's not there. I used to work for a company where we had customers all over the, all over the nation. And if I would, they would say, where are you located? And I'd say Springfield, Missouri. Same thing with what you said about St. Louis. They had never heard of Springfield, but they knew all about Branson. It went right by it. <coughs> It's, uh, well, it's that marketing. <clears throat> and what I have a hard time <clears throat> understanding is when you go to like to Oklahoma City or Albuquerque or something, they have these big advertisements on there for Branson. Mm -hmm. But you don't see that much of that here. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> that highway. <clears throat> but, you know, so... Like I said, uh, the mom and pop deals had no budget for advertising, but now that, that's the whole name of the game is advertising. Well, like AAA, when we would travel, 
what little bit we traveled, we couldn't leave the, our business much. Usually my dad and I would take a little trip, and then later in the summer my mom and I would take a little trip. Very rarely, unless it was something drastic like a de death in the family, could we all leave. But when we traveled, we pretty much stayed in the same type of place that what we had, and we ate at the same kind of places that we had. That was all pretty standard for the average family. Yeah, but I can remember when Seven Gables was kind of the place to go eat. I mean, it was good food. Yeah. We had a huge crowd after church on Sunday that was uh, mostly family people. Same thing on Saturday night. And you could get Swiss steak, mashed potatoes and gravy, big old piece of pie about six inches tall with some of the best food in town. It was more of a family style, even though it was a truck stop, it was more of a family restaurant style business than just trucks, which was, if you see the few truck stops left around now, you don't see a lot of, um, you know, families, you see mainly truck drivers. Well, there's a lot more truck drivers than there used to be. I'm sure that's true. But uh, you don't see what you would call the family restaurant anymore. Like Seven Gables, Hamby's, such as that, where you could go in and one member of the family could get what they wanted, another member, or, you know, I mean, <coughs> the restaurant or cafe or whatever where you could, everybody go in and get something they wanted. I mean, you can go in and get something you want now, but it's uh, all chain, and <coughs> if, you, if you go eat at a, a chain restaurant, in Springfield, you're going to eat in the same chain restaurant in California someplace, and the menu generally is the same. But people find security in that, but they don't find much individuality in that. Uh, and There's no adventure. <clears throat> no, when you travel and you get back, you don't say, oh, I remember eating at McDonald's and we still have Cal California or something. And when I travel, I still try to seek out the local good places. Oh, yeah. And There's a lot of people, I think, who like, who enjoy that. I think maybe that's the secret to Lambert's success is they still have hung on to this, you know, mom and pop style of business and home, good home-cooked meals. Of course, it's a huge restaurant. Mm -hmm. They're really big. Yeah. So, you must get a lot of local. A lot of the ones that relied on travelers aren't around anymore. You know? but, no. but we don't need to keep anyone if you need to leave. So what time is it going to be? It is one o'clock. Yeah, I'm going to have to go here. But yeah. Do we still have some scanning to do? Yes, so that's why I was okay. conscious of Well, we <coughs> appreciate you bringing your pictures and taking time out to come and visit with us today. Well, I appreciate that. It was a wonderful way to grow up. It was a different way to grow up. Um, you know, most kids lived in a regular neighborhood, a regular house. And our house had the words vacancy or no vacancy <laughs> on the front porch. And the, the desk where you actually signed up for your room was at the end of our living room. So strangers were in and out all the time. But at the same time, even though it was different and a little unusual, it gave me an incredible sense of, you know, the business world and treating people like they are family. And I think that's something, you know, everybody needs to remember. No matter what your job is, if you're dealing with people, people want to be treated, you know, want to, want to be appreciated and, um, you know, treat them like they want to be treated. Sometimes in today's world, people forget that. Well, you've got a broader view of the world. <clears throat> and today, a lot of kids sit in front of the computer or the TV and all, and that's the only interaction they have much with uh, yeah. anything, I mean. And it would be hard, to, you know, if you had that same setting in, you know, 2007, it would be much different and much more difficult. You know, there's a lot of trust issues that we have now that we didn't have back then. 
we thought nothing of being in bed asleep, doorbell rang at 2 o'clock in the morning, and open the door and just let somebody walk in when your wife and kid is in the next room sleeping. And we just didn't think much about that at all. We had a couple of instances that I remember were kind of scary and, and not a safe, good situation, but that didn't happen very often. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate I appreciate you inviting me here.